<laughs> well, welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. We have we have a fun one today. Oh, wait, Kyle. I hope we're not hot. Already. <laughs> oh, man. You know, I've been saving up my money just for a lawsuit. So that's good. <laughs> we could just have that bleeped out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. It'll be 1930. Bleep. Yeah. We've got, uh, just that part. We've yeah. got Kyle Lamb joining us. Uh, General Clay Hutton Hutton Marker. The Falkenstein. Yeah. Don't even try that again. Just <laughs> move on. Hut Marker. Uh, and then Tier Simek. Hello. Red Lady again. Red Leader standing by. Sitting here. Standing red, by. Red Leader sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Tiger Swan was uh I did I did their video their first video when uh Kyle Dufour was teaching for them and uh, went out, I guess, uh, Brian had hired, uh, a guy from Hollywood or something. And, and this dude came out and was just, you know, oh, I don't like how the sun is. Can you guys shoot this direction? And they're like, this is a range. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, uh, Max Mullen had recommended cause Brian, I guess was saying, Hey, I don't Mad know. Max. Mad oh, Max that's Mullen. a blast from the past. Uh, you know him too, right? Max. Mullen? They call him Mad Max, Black Ranger oh. dude. Just a d- big, the dude is just yeah, just yeah, yeah, he yeah, served yeah, all yeah. three Ranger battalions. Yeah. He he was an RI twice. Like uh, retired he retires as a sergeant major, master sergeant, master sergeant. Yeah, he's a character. Um, I think did he run? Uh, he was around T two when T two was uh, in the Rangers. I think that's how I. Oh, he might have been. Yeah, yeah, been, yeah. When he was one seven five or something. Yeah. So then he started doing airsoft. Max told yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, and that's that's where I met him uh, was because this guy uh, had Operation Lion Claws, which was a recreation of Somalia, and they had Colonel McKnight and Mad Max as the two team leaders when they would reenact it. Um, and yeah, so Max told Brian, call me if you want a video, and I drove from Fort Walton Beach, Florida to North Carolina unpacked at the range was there for like four hours put everything back in the car drove home and had him a video in like four days and then it was brian's word of mouth that essentially started up bot stick collective for me and gary stevens uh and aj miller at that time so that's how we started getting all yeah, the yeah, shot show cool, contracts and yeah like that's how i started meeting everybody was dude these guys just showed up shot and disappeared and then we had a finished product that we liked and now yeah. there's not a single person I bet that you could name that he doesn't know. <laughs> well, I purposely haven't brought up my wife's name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we all know her. <laughs> oh, uh, see, I couldn't say that when I was in the army with this joke, <laughs> but now I can say whatever. You I still want. can't, bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, welcome you guys. I'm glad to have you. You're out here. You get your. You both are here for the grand opening tomorrow of the store. You know, we we just launched this in the ECS, the Gothic Dot Gothic Serpent Rose, um, which we're coming up on the anniversary uh, tomorrow. tomorrow. And you were there. Yes, I was. Although I was stuck in the fetal position for most of the gunfight, it was. Uh, yeah, I was there. That's how I spend mine most. Yeah. mostly too, but. Yeah. yeah, that you know, it seems like a thousand years ago when when you look back at I think it's is it twenty seven years? Uh yeah, twenty uh so ninety three, yeah. Were you a ranger years. then or were you with Delta? No, I was in the unit. Yeah. yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Shit. So I was a young I was pretty young when I came over and I got to the unit the fall of ninety one. I got recycled in OTC because I broke my leg. Mm. So then I got to sea and was there for six months and then went to you're on the same team as Tom Satterley? No, no. I was on a team. So you remember John Hale? Yeah, yeah, yeah. John Hale was my team sergeant. Mm. Earl Fillmore was a two IC. So Earl was one of the guys that was killed on the third. Um, John Hale, I mean, Lumpy, was the best. One of the, well, as a team leader, I'd say he's probably the best team leader I ever had. And our team leaders were NCOs. They weren't mm-hmm. officers. Um and then, of course, unfortunately, John committed suicide a few years ago. Yeah, I heard that. That was a sad deal. You know, and that's the, it, it's one of those things that, and I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer here, but, you mm-hmm. know, the reality of, of, of that is, you know, what, what really bothered him throughout his life 
after Somalia was losing his best friend, Earl Fillmore. Mm. So it's something, you know, you knew, did you know Earl as well? Vaguely. I mean, okay. I was young, real young. Earl was one of the smartest dudes I ever met. And he would, he would pick either side. So like he was from Pennsylvania. So if he, if he wanted to, to talk about the civil war, if you were from the South, then he'd be from Pennsylvania. If you were from the North, then he'd, he would be from Georgia. Yeah. He'd be from the <laughs> South and he would, he would, you but know, argue he loved equally to effectively either oh, way. Yeah, right? He could debate like crazy. So we'd have these discussions in the team room and he'd tell me one day, he's like, you know, lamb, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> now I'd heard that before from my parents, but I'm shocked. But yeah. Ahead, yeah. <laughs> but he, 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 he told me, he said, dude, do you not, read history. And I was embarrassed because you're at the unit, you're looking up at all these guys. They're these, these heroes, you know? And, and he's like, I'm disappointed. Don't you know anything about history? And I was like, uh, actually no, <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> grew up in South Dakota. So what history do they have? I mean, there's not a lot of history in there. They got Sacagawea. <laughs> yeah. You know who that is? Yes. That's the first known, um, government voucher fraud. You didn't know that? Yeah, no. so Sacagawea, she was an Indian. They they came back and they're like, man, we spent all this money. What are we going to do? Man, I got an idea. Tell them that the Indian gal was our guide and we paid her. And she took us around and showed us where everybody's at. Of course, I'm making all this up. Yeah. But <laughs> voucher fraud. It was voucher fraud because they're not going to get an Indian oh gal to take them to the chiefs of other tribes and do this. Anyway, so Earl, <laughs> Earl makes fun of me for being historically inept. Yeah. And he brought in a book and it was a book about Nathan Bedford Forrest. Now, I don't care where you are in the world. I don't care if you're part of the cancel culture or not, which obviously nobody here is, <laughs> but Nathan Bedford Forrest is one of the greatest cavalry commanders ever to walk, maybe only second to Genghis Khan. And I would debate that with a lot of people. He was, he was an amazing leader. So he gives me this book about um, Nathan Bedford Forrest, who I don't know if you guys, do you know who that is? Oh. <laughs> okay, so he fought for the South. He was a cavalry commander, first NBF cavalry. And uh, he, was, he grew up in Tennessee. He uh, was a slave trader. He ended up being the first leader of the KKK. That's one of the stories. Now that's that's unfortunate, you know, and and you know, going back in time. But at that time, slavery was legal. Um, he changed his ways after the war, but during the war, he was just unbelievable. Like at Shiloh, and Shiloh is only about an hour and fifteen minutes from my house. Battle of Shiloh was when the Southern Army. Um, PGT Beauregard and mm. Albert Sidney Johnston, who was killed at the Battle of Shiloh. They came north from Mississippi, Corinth, Mississippi, and they were coming up to Shiloh and they were gonna, they're gonna overrun these, these Union troops there. And Grant was in charge. So they come in there and they put a whooping on them. Uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, he went out that night and said, we gotta keep hitting them because he's got reinforcements coming. And at the time, Buell, Carlos Buell, I think it was Carlos Buell was his name, right? He was coming from uh, Nashville, coming up the river, and he was dropping his troops there. So Forrest knew that we were we were on a time crunch. So that night he was riding around trying to get folks. Oh, and that day, uh, Albert Sidney Johnson was shot. He was with, there were some interesting things on that battle. We're not talking about Somalia, but... <laughs> Are you, are you okay? <laughs> yes, okay. We're gonna, we'll get there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's going to take a while so, at this so rate. So some of yeah. the similar things, though. So <laughs> Albert Sidney Johnson was shot behind the leg um, just above his boot. He's with the governor of Tennessee, and the governor of Tennessee doesn't know how to apply a tourniquet and didn't know where the, where the wound was at because, you know, the blood was running into his boot. So Albert Sidney Johnson, who was not Joe Johnston, who was not probably a good leader, but Albert Sidney Johnson was very well respected. He went down and basically sat down by a tree and died. So Forrest was like, we got to get in there. We got to get these guys tonight. He was a little upset because he couldn't find his son. And then his son comes walking in. He's just a little kid. And he brings back 12 Union soldiers that he's got at gunpoint and taken a prisoner. <laughs> so then the next day, um, I'll, I'll get through this a little faster here because you guys are about to gloss over. But uh, <laughs> the Union 
won the next day because now they've got Buell's guys and they overrun. Right. Yeah, they, they overrun the South. Right. So the Confederates start to leave. They're heading back to Corinth, Mississippi, and they've got a hospital on this ridge line. It's called Fallen Timbers, not Fallen Timbers when we fought the Indians, but Fallen Timbers of of this area. <clears throat> so Forrest looks down and he sees Sherman, who Sherman, whether you know, I'll probably get hate mail for this, but Sherman was a, a warrior. I mean, he did a lot of things in the South mm-hmm. that the South hated, but that dude was a brilliant guy. Um, he sees Sherman coming with his troops. They've got a, a, a hospital set up on this ridge line, and he's like, we can't let them overrun our hospital. So he says, let's go, boys. Boom, and they charge right down in the main line. And uh, can you imagine that? You're down Just, there trying to get in line, and all of a sudden, here comes cavalry running into your ranks. Well, one guy had enough presence of mind you know, they're all like, shoot him, shoot him. And everybody's shooting at Forrest. He, he outran his headlights there. And one of the guys sticks a rifle into his hip. Boom! And shoots him. Wow. Like, contact shoots him. Blows him out of the saddle. And he pulls himself back up. And he's like, oh, that's going to leave a mark. <laughs> he was an outstanding horseman. So he reached down. And he grabbed a Union soldier by the back of his jacket. And swung him up behind his horse for protection and he ran to friendly lines with this dude hanging off the back of him (laughs) after he'd been shot after he'd been shot and then he got to the lines he dropped the dude and then he continued on to corinth mississippi so he gets there they they operate on him and they can't they can't find this ball so fast forward he takes some leave because he's like man that really hurts (laughs) and they didn't have motrin then you know they didn't have the the motrin lick that us military guys are used to (laughs) bellying up to there so uh when the battle of Corinth happened, you know, I don't know, it was, it was a little bit in the near future there. Um, he jumped his horse over a wall and he's like, Oh, now it's hurting again. And then they actually did surgery again and they were able to, to get Find that out. But yeah, he was a, that dude was a warrior, but you know, you think of what happened in Somalia, we had, um, so when we were going to the first crash site, um, Jamie Smith, one of the Rangers that, that passed away, he was shot when I was standing next to him and, um, Larry Perino, you remember Larry Perino? Mm-hmm. Lieutenant Larry Perino was there, who he retired as a colonel. I just saw him a couple of weeks ago down in, in Florida. And uh, we started working on him. And you couldn't put a tourniquet on because he was shot high in the femoral artery and it shattered his pelvis. So direct pressure was the only thing that, that worked. But the interesting thing is we weren't carrying tourniquets. That's 1993. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, in the Battle of Shiloh, if I'm not mistaken, was in 1862. And you'd think that, you know, we had learned some of those lessons, but then we had unlearned them during other wars where, oh, you can't put a tourniquet on because of whatever. And now you can't find, you're not going to find a soldier without a tourniquet yeah, on right, the kit. Right, 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 right. Um, we, a lot of us didn't have our night vision goggles when we went out in the streets that day because, oh, it's a daylight hit. So we left our NVGs in the rear because at that time we had uh, rolled in there. We're still wearing the ProTech helmets. So mm-hmm. they were the plastic hockey helmets. And um, we just, we didn't, if you didn't have your nods on, you weren't going to carry them. Where are you going to put them? You know, now everybody has a little case that they put them in the back of their kit and then they can throw them on when they need to. Um, so we get out there in that gunfight. We don't have nods. So you, you were friends with, with Cliff and oh yeah, my middle son is Mitchell Walcott Hutmacher. Oh wow, yeah. You, you see what's behind us here? See that picture? That kudu there? Yeah. So Cliff, another Somalia war story. We went out to shoot pigs. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. think I heard about. So this, I was yeah. in Cliff and and Don. So Cliff, Cliff Walcott and Donovan Briley, and you, and you, you're the expert on the Hilo stuff. So you. Tell me if I get this wrong. Well, first of all, Donovan Briley was a Native American. He was. They called him Bull. Bull. So I drew a picture on the side of the helicopter in chalk. I drew one that was a picture of Cliff. They called him Elvis. Yeah. Velvet I, Elvis. And they. Go ahead. Yeah. They, uh, <laughs> that picture that I drew, they took a picture of Cliff in front of that. And that's the picture that hangs in the Hall of Heroes down at Fort Rucker. The Donovan Briley picture, I I drew a. They called him Bull. That's that's it. That's the picture. That's the picture. That's yeah. The picture. So I drew the I drew the little the little Elvis that's on the bird behind him, and uh, on the other side I drew. I a did picture not of, know you drew. Yeah, that. I drew a picture of an Indian with huge nuts, 
Because that's how he got the nickname is he what did. I was he told. Did. He did. I he never did. looked at his sack, but I'll have to take your word for he, that. He's sort of like JT in the leadership de- challenge department. <laughs> Uh, and Bull was a scrapper too. He uh, yeah, oh, he liked guy. the fist fight. Yeah, he's so they were so they had they were DAP pilots. Yeah. So that you're imagine you're flying with a gun guy. Yeah. You're not flying with a normal Blackhawk pilot. And I'm not saying normal Blackhawk pilots are bad. They're not. Mm-hmm. But those jokers did not yeah. take it's our a welfare. Hovering, into, it's, a, it's a hovering A10. But they yeah. flew, and it was rid- – we went out one day, and we flew for a half an hour doing an overflight, and I was not allowed to sit in the door that day. And I didn't – I don't think I sat in the door. I'd sat in the door when we were shooting pigs out of the bird, but I never sat in the door when we were going out and do missions. And I never saw the horizon for a half an hour. <laughs> I mean, I'd see it, but it was going by because it was ground, sky, ground, sky. We got back, and I've never been – ne- I to this day, I haven't got motion sickness where I threw up, but – I was jacked up for like two days. Were you? I was like, oh yeah. my goodness. So anyway, we went out to to hunt that day and Jim Smith was with with me on my side of the bird. We're shooting these pigs and all of a sudden there's a kudu. And I never shot a kudu before. Well, I, I didn't there either, but um, Steve Delellis took a shotgun. A, it was like a, a Remington 1100. And he passed that up to Cliff in the, in the, I think Cliff was fire, fire, uh, flying left front, if I'm not mistaken. He normally did yeah. fly left seat. Yep. Yeah. So he's Donovan, flying yeah. left front. He gets that shotgun, shoo, shoo, puts around in the chamber, and he kills a kudu from the bird. From, from the cockpit. From the cockpit. <laughs> so we land. I had forgotten about yeah, that. So yeah, so we yeah. land, and we we butcher this kudu. Yeah, did you did you guys really bring him back and have a oh, barbecue? Yeah. Well, no. Oh. We did, yes. Yeah. We brought him back, and then the medic— not one of our medics, but somebody above us said, oh, no, they're, they're not good for human consumption. It's like, you're an idiot. <laughs> you're, just because a bunch of people have AIDS there doesn't mean that the, the hogs have AIDS. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Well, they're not hogs. I guess they're, they're warthogs, so they're a little different than a, than a pig. So but. you guys didn't have the barbecue that was in the movie? No. Damn it. Yeah. We didn't have the barbecue, but we did bring all the meat back. So they, would, they were working on this hide of this kudu, and... They had it in their shack. So the pilots had air conditioned shacks because they had to get so much sleep because they, you know, they're flying people around. <laughs> I'm sitting right here, bro. You, think, <laughs> yeah, you, thought, hey. you thought this one was going to be, it was. <laughs> no, no, no wait, wait a minute. Shots. Wait a minute. I'm going to tell goes. you. He's already starting wait. in. <laughs> Well, the because pretty is, soon is he's going to look right, at these jokers left. and he's going to say, mute that dude's mic. And I want to get every <laughs> lick in that I can. <laughs> We've known each other for 25, at 26, least. at least. Yeah. Probably right around 93. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Cause so, I had just given, I had just given up that platoon. Trey Williams was the platoon leader over there with, yeah. uh, with Cliff and Mike. And, uh, and do you remember when they, uh, the warrants took, Trey on his birthday and taped him to that cot. And oh pulled his yeah, pants well they did down. that to uh, uh to Garrison too. They pulled his pants down and said spank me and hung him by the defect. Garrison, no, no. Well, no, God, yeah, no, that yeah, was a two yeah, star. Yeah, they did yeah. that to Trey. Though. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was funny because we had to pull, we had to pull KP. So you'd go to pull KP, and there's like a E three Ranger. You you had to pull KP. Oh yeah, yeah we yeah. all did. Wow, everybody. <laughs> yeah, did. holy we, shit. So we pulled. So you got like an E seven pulling. You KP didn't have a D cell with an or anybody E3. with you. Yeah, and yeah, it was yeah, it was crazy. Um, anyway, so he kills this kudu, and then they they had that hide in their hooch, and they were salting it, and you know, and they kept trying to flesh it out. And I I wonder whatever happened to that set of horns. Do you know? I do not know, but you know who will know is Mike Grant. I'm going to see him week after next. I think I'm going to see him on the 19th uh, of October down in Huntsville. Have you you ever f- flown him? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Countless times. <laughs> yeah. Countless times. He's a very needy passenger. Uh, I, I mean, can not tell. enough penis. Find us something to shoot. <laughs> yeah. He's <laughs> very yeah. needy. Yeah. And not very appreciative either, actually, you know, afterwards. See, now that just hurts. <laughs> that just hurts. <laughs> I kind of had a reputation in the unit because I got along with everybody. Yeah. yeah. He was, he was. So I, I don't see that now. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. With the, of course, with the 160th guys, because they are, don't tell him I said this, but mm-hmm. the most amazing pilots in the world. I mean, there's nobody 
everybody can say what they want to say. There, there's no pilots as good as these guys in the entire world. And as far as we know, entire universe. True. That, but we haven't <laughs> we haven't done the survey out yeah, that far. But, yeah, I mean, that. but even if you did the survey, I think you'd still win. I mean, yeah. Where are you mailing that? <laughs> yeah. So that's a big deal <laughs> when you're Morgan. you know when you're looking at what you've got to do on the battlefield. So you know Somalia was a good example, and the places that they were putting us then and pilots. I don't think the pilots have gotten any better, but I do think some of the training has gotten yeah. better. And I think also some of the repetition that these guys do on the battlefield has made them better, you know, cause talking about guys that have been in, in war for all these years. Well, you know, before, you know, this, this is the example that I use. So back in the day when I first got there as a Lieutenant, um, we had a 72 hour planning cycle, you know, and desert storm was like this when we yeah. were going against those scuds and the guys were in the gowers and all that. And, uh, it was receive the mission, plan it, brief it, rehearse it, rebrief it and execution. And it was doctrinally, it was a three day, a three day process. When you flash forward to Iraq in, uh, 06, 05, I mean, if we were on the ground 30 minutes from the time we got a frago or got on a target, it was, we were on the ground way too long. And in fact, what we ended up waiting on most of the time was the printer to print out the GRG and the yeah. Uh, imagery. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing too about that is when you say that in previously you would, you know, you, the military decision-making process is three courses of action, blah, 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 the right, commander, right. whatever. So in the unit you get five courses of action from every team. And then the team leaders pick basically the, the plan they want. And then those three team leaders and the troops are a major and troop commander pick that. And then, so that happens in like two minutes. Yes. Very and then quick. you still, if you need to rehearse, you still will rehearse. You definitely, um, you briefed everybody. So if we're going to do a mission and the Rangers are there with us and you guys are always there too, the Air Force is there on every single hit that we did. Mm -hmm. um, the CCT guys, and I'm sure you've heard me say this before, but those guys are the most talented dudes in the deck. And I say that because they could do everything. They could do everything with us and then they could go up with the SEALs and do everything with them. I can't they were do that. a franchise player. Yeah, totally I can't do that. I mean, I can't, I can't put on scuba gear and go do that and then go out and do a halo mission and then go out and do a whatever. Oh, and then they can, oh, they can clean this HLZ for us and you guys are going to trust them. Oh, and then they can call for bombs. I mean, they can do everything. They could yeah. do it all. Um, yeah, it, that, that, that process, 30 minutes. I mean, that's everybody getting briefed and then out the door loading on the helicopters and, and the pilots, everybody did their part. And what was cool about it was you, you, when you looked at a one sixtieth guy, this was the guy that I've known for 10 years. Yeah. This isn't some dude that showed up on the battlefield yeah. and you're like, yeah, you're hey, just, nice to meet you. You're, you're stepping you're right. in a bird and just seeing yeah, two helmets in the front. Like, yeah, there's yeah. a trust there and from and it repetitive. Uh, I'm going to give you a name. Wade Ayala. I know way, yeah. Uh, oh my goodness! Wrestled for what Montana? This dude, he was if the, he got a hold of you, he would pop your head off like a zip. Yeah, he was under. I think he yeah. wrestled was for he Montana Indian State. Too? He looked kind of yeah. Indian. He wrestled yeah. for Montana State. He was C Company. Yeah, he retired a few years ago. Amazing pilot. Yeah, really good. He was a DAP driver. Yeah, yeah. He driver. was. I crashed with him a couple times. Yeah, and he's still an amazing pilot. No, he <laughs> put us right where. No, when I say crash. <laughs> He put us right where we needed to be. It's just that we couldn't quite get there, yeah. <laughs> but we got there. You know what I'm saying? That's, <laughs> so that's what's amazing. Here's a dude that's like, I'm going to put you where it's impossible to put you. And then I'm going to get my bird out of there. Yeah. Even though my bird, most people would say it's, it's, it's deadline right now, but yeah. I'm going to yeah. go ahead and fly it back and fly it and watch it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, the other thing too, that's interesting. Um, you went to Balad. Oh yeah. Lots of times. Yeah. So watching those crew chiefs, and this is something that, that a lot of times is not made public, but the mechanics in the crew chiefs, it, it's kind of like in the unit. If you didn't have the, the guys in the chow hall and the, and the guys that are running the vehicles and the medics and all this, you couldn't do your job. Right. In the 160th, you could have the greatest pilots in the world, but if you didn't have the birds that would run, and these guys would do a, what's it called? The inspection when they have to phase, tear it all the way down. Uh, phase maintenance. 
they would take a little bird and tear it completely apart. apart. Completely Bake apart. the engine, the transmission, everything. And that 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 has that yep, hardened yep, shelter yep. right there. Yep. yep. Jamie right next Gerard to and I used to go run that. We would run the for PT. That's back Jamie when I still did Gerard. PT. Then I found out that running was a sign of cowardice. <laughs> As you can see, I found that out too. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, those guys, the 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 uh just that whole unit. I mean, it's, it is. there is no, we can't do it. It's like, Roger that. Those guys work 24 hours a day to make Who that happen. Who was the warrant on the little bird that stayed out like the whole night that night? Just running, coming back for fuel and ammo. And well, every, so no, all, of them, all huh? of them did. But uh, so there was a couple of noteworthy. So, landing in the street was Carl and Keith. Yeah, Carl Meyer. Carl Meyer. And yeah, Carl, Carl Meyer, Meyer would tell right the story. In the right, street. and they pulled out the two wounded guys. Yep. Keith Dan, jumped out. Yep. Dan Bush. So Dan Bush was a guy I went through OTC with. He he ended up passing away. Right. But, he was gut shot. Yeah. Right? And yeah. then when he was getting drugged to the bird, uh, Jim Smith got shot. Not Jamie Smith, Jim Smith, who was in our unit. But yeah, Carl landed right. Right in the right, intersection. Yeah. I saw him uh, last year. I went yeah, there. He lives in Clark's. He works on the compound. Yeah, yeah but that's where I saw him. He held the cyclic in his knees um, and had an MP5. That's when we were carrying MP5. That was the last stop we ever yeah. carried MP5s yeah. on. And Dito and his guys, his platoon came around the corner and he he would tell me, he told me many times, he said, I came this close to shooting Dito. And the only reason that he didn't is he saw the outline of his helmet Yeah, because he was covering down that uh, avenue of approach down that alley with an MP5 holding the cyclic in his knees. Why Holy did that. shit. Oh, the, this guy. Well, all those guys. I mean, it's, it, you can't like point out one dude and say, oh, he's the best. Because like... They're all the best, well, you know. And Dan Gelato, when he yeah. got hit with that RPG, was yeah. roping in the uh, special tactics guys, and the RPG hit the side of the aircraft, ricocheted up, went into the main rotor blade, and exploded and caught his aircraft on fire. And he had him on the rope, and he held it uh, until they got off the rope, and then took it smoking back to. Uh, yeah, wow. and Dan. So Dan Beautiful. was there. Another guy, Stan Wood. Yep, Stan. So Stan yeah. was a former. He Ranger. was in my platoon. Yeah. yeah. So that's what's he's cool two seven five guy. Was he 275? 275, okay. yeah. So Stan was a former Ranger, became a pilot. Gelada was a former Special Forces Special dude. Force guy. They yeah. were both in my platoon. Yeah. yeah. They Cliff, were just Donovan, amazing. Uh, and Mike, all in my platoon. You know, oh, remember uh, Tony Rinder? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Tony was is a uh, stone cold killer. I mean, yeah. he used to tell me, he said, yeah, after Somalia, I really struggled with compassion. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what really killed him was he told me that he was orbiting around and, you know, he'd cycle through all the freaks, you know, listening to different freaks when he's flying. And he could hear Shugart and Gordon calling for support and saying, hey, and if you don't come and uh, and they never got there. Um, and Mike tells an equally compelling story when he hands him the M M16 out of the back. They're spare the A2. They were carrying A2s as a backup. And said, God bless you. I got to go around the other side. And then was killed a couple seconds later. You know, mm -hmm. when Dietz drew that print, uh, Brad Holling, who lost his leg yeah, there, yeah. he came to me and he goes, what do you think of this, Sodbuster? And he showed me the drawing. And I said, well, it's cool, but it's wrong. And he's like, whatever. And I go, and I get the wrong guns. What do you mean the wrong guns? And I said, well, so Gary... M14, Gordon. right? No, or he no. was carrying a, an M4. Right. Well, it wasn't M4. It's a car 15 at the car time, 15, yeah. but he had an integral suppressor on it. So I'm a gun guy. Yeah. So I know, I know guns. You That's know guns. all I know. I don't know anything other than guns. <laughs> so uh, I said, but, but Randy. That's not what he was carrying. He didn't have an M14 with a scope on it. He had oh, an M14 I... with the red dot. And they go, they go, no, he didn't. And Brad's like, no, he, he had, you know, a loophole scope on there. And I said, now nah, he had an aim point, but whatever. I don't care. I mean, it's your print. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, really, I, I, I got a copy of it. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I don't really care. And I don't mean that in a negative right, way. Right. It's just like, it's not it's accurate, a print, though. whatever. It's not accurate. You know, I'm sure Custer didn't have as good a hair as they give him in all those prints <laughs> either. You know? <laughs> so uh, Brad come to me a few days later and he goes, you were right. If you go home and look at that print, I got that print hanging in my office. Got an aim point on that now. 
Does it? Yeah. <laughs> and that's maybe I saw a draft version or a different version, but I've got it. I've got yeah, yeah. I have it's, most of the Deets prints. Some of them right. I gave away, like the dark one, the Desert One one, which I thought was sort of Yeah, I don't have that one. Yeah. And the Legacy um, of Honor, that's my favorite one. Yeah. So the so they they went through the pictures. Brad was pissed. He's like, Kyle said it was an aim point, but he's wrong. And then he started looking through the pictures. He's like, crap. And there it was that day before that mission. Randy was standing by his bunk. They t somebody had taken a picture, and there was his M14 with an aim point on it. So they changed that in that in that print. Just a little bit of history, I guess. But it's you know, it's one of them things that I I knew guns. I don't can't tell you anything about the helicopters, but I know a little <laughs> bit about the, the guns there. But uh, yeah, that was uh, that was quite a ordeal. I'd never been exposed to anything quite like that. I don't know that really anybody in yeah. our task force had or and i said i mean we've had some pretty significant scrapes since then but oh, that yeah. was you guys, the only support you had were ah6s right there's no gunships yeah, we in had, theater nothing we had ah6s and that's it and they were using the 60s for which was a hindsight not anybody a great have idea. any lasers at ground commander yeah, 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 oh yeah, yeah, yeah oh no yeah, yeah, no yeah, we yeah. had it aim we one. had laser we had aim ones and then we had what was the pec two pec ones or pec, pec, no, pec, pec one ones, or two pec ones pec one yeah. well you know the interesting thing is so this will flash forward. I don't know if you know this, but <clears throat> so I'm the our SOAC commander now. I'm a one star, and they made, stood up that one star special op, Army Special Ops Aviation Command. And uh, um, Laura, the uh, Fox News reporter, Ingram. Uh, no, 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 no. Oh. Um, Laura Logan. Oh. Laura Logan. Yep. Laura Logan. Um, Bob Whitzer, remember he's flying an oh, MH6. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Bob, I went sailing with him last weekend, but Bob. Oh, what a they, good dude. They, they, great This guy, guy looks like he's eight years old. He does, still. Yeah. Still. Uh, but he, they said, hey, um, Laura Logan, she's South African, and uh, she wants to talk to you. And I said, well, I don't normally talk to the press. She said, no, it's not about that. They did do a special on 60 Minutes. You might have seen that. But see that. anyway, they said, hey, they um, this group, they, they got the wreckage. Oh, uh, yeah, Super yeah. 6 1. So, one group got the wreckage of Super 6 1 out of the market. They went in there on a Sunday morning when no one was around because they were going to concrete over it. Uh, and they were expanding that market. And they had it in an ISU 90. And then another competing, con they were both security contractors. Alicia Rue was the wife of the guy who went and got the aircraft. Another guy came up and he had Durant's minigun. Still with the AIM-1 laser zip tied on that rail across the top, it had been oil, kept up in oil, and it was sitting in the Airborne Special Ops Museum after that. So we recovered all that, and then they shipped it to Kenya, Mombasa, and it got stuck in customs. So I had to go through the embassy and have one of the have a uh, commands bird uh, 130 loaded up, and that's what was all the. The wreckage in that display, the rotor head right. for Cliff that's so, in the museum. And you know all they that. recovered another minigun. Oh, they did. I only I only knew about the one that, that I know about. Our guys were not our guys, but our task force right. was there in Somalia. And they, they got did a, a mission, second one. And the dude had it hanging on his wall as a on his I love me trophy, wall. huh? Mm -hmm. Yep. Good. And they put it in a crate as if it was a coffin and put a draped flag over it. I and, saw uh, that. Actually, yeah. I do. I saw that. Yeah. And That's in fact, a way to do it. Yeah. So yeah, they, they got actually it. had to oh. demill those guns. They were still operational. They just didn't have an AC power source. Yeah. The hook to them, but Isn't the guns crazy? were still That's operational. Wild. I mean, and the, the thing that's crazy about that is it's, you know, we're still finding balls, civil war from the civil war, you know, lead balls, mini, mini balls or whatever they're called, maxi, whatever they're called. You're fine. You know, we're finding those. But we're still killing the same bad guys in Somalia today oh, yeah. as we were and killing in 93. You know, you said, do you have any air coverage? We weren't allowed to have any air because of the, the leadership at that time said yeah. no air. And the AC would have been really effective. Oh, yeah, they, yeah, that would have changed the fight that Absolutely night. Absolutely oh, yeah. would have. Well, I mean, they were scared really, to death of that So, thing. yeah, it would have changed the fight. But here's the thing. Why, why did we stay there? We didn't stay there because we couldn't leave. Yeah. We stayed there because we couldn't get Cliff out of the wreckage. There was right. no oh, yeah. there was right. no bad guys saying we couldn't move. There was a good guy, one of our own, that had fallen and right. we could not leave his body. So 
Those jokers were were shooting dudes 30 yards from us with miniguns from their bird. You know, you talking about danger close. It yeah. was danger close. And there was one particular call that that I had made. I made the call, but I didn't have NVGs because Woody had put the NV, you know, Woody Woodall. Yeah, yeah, he put yeah. the NVGs on. He was lazing it. It was either him or or uh Tony Copper. Bird, you know, dash one pops up. They're doing their thing. Phew. RPG comes up. Well, dash two pops up. Thinks that's the he sees the dude pulling another RPG out of his backpack to lo- reload. And he's like, Rrr. When he hits him with a rocket, we hear this huge explosion. We think. So he got a secondary off the RPG. He blew that joker up. <laughs> oh, did he? So, yeah. So that, you know, we thought we had another bird down at that point. We're like, oh, crap. And then we hear him, you know, coming over top of us or, or you know, the sound they make. And yeah, it was, it was an interesting, interesting battle. I think what I like about the whole thing, and because there's a whole lot to not like about it. You know, we lost a lot of good folks there. We probably didn't execute the way we would today just because we didn't have the training. We didn't have the planning. We didn't have the equipment. Experience. Yeah, the experience. But the thing I do like about it is because of that mission, we now have the training. We now have the experience. We now have the equipment. Yes. We, it's everything from medical to the planning to the way you guys fly to the way that we rig the birds to the way that you carry your weapon. I mean, all of Speed that. Speed balls came yeah, out of that. Yeah. The Reds kits came out of that. All that stuff came out of that. Yeah, and if you look back, um, I told somebody this the other day, and they got a little offended because they were unit dude, but I said, if you took a ranger today and you teleported him back to that time period, he would be a better shooter oh. than Oh, without, than we without. were back oh, in well, the I mean, day. That's just experience of ranger. Oh, yeah, There's some rangers amazing, right though. now that, are, you know, have been in for five years and have 10 deployments. Yeah, and, uh, and that's the thing. You know, we got this, we, but we've done that before. You know, if you look at uh, uh, Korea is a great example. what did you guys at the unit, what did you guys done up to that point that even remotely compared? Like, uh, other than Panama. Yeah, and we Desert Storm, but it was different. That was a strat yeah, yeah. recce more. I was than, in fifth group then, yeah. Yeah, and Panama. And that was it, right? I mean, except for Grenada. Grenada was and there was I'm sure there was a gap. Same maybe a few guys left between those, but Yeah, and I think that it's it, they're just it was it was a great experience to build it was a great experience to build experience. Yes. And it worked for all of our units, whether you were a ranger or you know, an Air Force dude or a SEAL, you know, we had some SEAL dudes there too. Uh, my buddy Homer was one of the guys. He's Near telling pass, me about the yeah, stuff yeah. that he saw. And I'm like, what? You know, I, you couldn't fathom that this would happen to us. I mean, we're America. We shouldn't have this happening. But um, yeah, it's it's the experience that was gained there. And then that was passed on. I think it's it's uh, it's priceless, you know? Well, you know, I was, there was a some, I was training for another because remember Haiti was bubbling up yeah. around the same time and uh Mike's when Mike got captured um well first when he was reported he was gone so I thought he was dead I was yeah. and they uh, his wife called me and I flew up there because I just thought he was dead and I was gonna take care of his family we got there is when the video came out where he's holding up himself up against the wall but anyway the funny thing so Gordon Sullivan was the chief of staff of the army then. Mm-hmm. And when they started bringing him back, it was then Colonel Brown was regimental commander. And I was, Mike and I, are, you know, been close for for many years. And he said, hey, I want you to come with us. We're going to go meet him in Ramstein. And I was a captain. And so we land at Ramstein commercial. Durant's wife, me, this uh, psychologist who I called uh, Doc Hollywood because uh, he, I mean, he 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 loved the camera. Yeah. And then yeah. a SOCOM PA or used to SOC PAO dude and myself. So anyway, we get to the airport and these four colonels uh, are standing there from I think Seventh Corps. And what I didn't know is Gordon Sullivan had assigned these four colonels. Hey, I want you to stay with them and take care of them, and we're gonna. I want you to update me on all their moves. So I'm this captain, and I'm walking down this airport we're in frankfurt and i'm walking down this long hallway and this colonel i'm a cat you know oh three he's an oh six <laughs> and he's like um hey clay i'm colonel so and so i'm like hey sir how's it going and he said do you need anything can i get you anything <laughs> and uh 
Colonel Brown, I don't know, you know if he remembers this, he's walking next to me and, and I was like, well, sir, you know, I'm sort of thirsty. I could use a Diet Coke. <laughs> and he's like, I'll, I'll get it. And, uh, you know, there's this colonel running in there <laughs> and Brown reaches over and he goes, okay, that's the last Diet Coke a colonel's getting for Captain Huttmacher. <laughs> like, hey, sir, how hey, many, yeah, I yeah. said, how many times is that going to happen in my life? <laughs> <laughs> that I get a colonel to go get me a, yeah. a Diet Coke. It goes, well, it's happened and it's never happening again. And I was like, All right. <laughs> that process too, that alert um, or that notification process was all jacked up. Oh, it was, yeah. And that's another thing that we learned there that has been applied. Blackout, like combo blackout. We're much better at it now. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. I think I think it's hard to do a combo blackout, but it is Especially easy to get the information right. And here's the other thing. As my wife said, we're not telling you. My wife, when I was a troop sergeant major, she told all the wives, she said, you don't need to know anything. And they're like, what do you mean by that? And she goes, these guys are in a fight. If something happens... We'll find out when we need to find out. That doesn't change anything. What you don't want to have happen is what happened in Somalia, where there were people told that their husbands were dead, and they weren't. weren't. There were guys, wives that were told they were missing, and they weren't. It wasn't good. No. So fast forward, um, 05, I had a couple of my guys out west that were killed. Uh, Mike McNulty and Bob Horrigan, which mm. you knew. I know oh, you knew yeah, Bob. Yeah, yeah, I'm not yeah, sure yeah, if you know Mike. I like but, Mike. Um, and all of a sudden, my wife is at ground zero as the troops are major's wife. And she had to now say, oh, crap, you know, what do we, we got to do this right. We can't get this wrong like we right. did back in 93. Um, and I think you, you uh, a lot of times we forget about that because we're always downrange. And I'm going to tell you, their, their job is way harder than ours. No, I agree. My daughter works for the government, and when she's been deployed, I've been a wreck. And I can't imagine my wife didn't know really what was going on most of the time when I was gone. They, that's just their life. I mean, yeah. what? You just leave. It's just yeah. crazy, man. And when you're you think leaving about to that. go do the most dangerous thing on the planet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I tell you. Over it's... and over and over again now. Yeah. So you're on, you know, every 12 to, six, I guess, 16 months now, you're four months deployed in combat. And so, I mean, it's a routine. It's not a one and done like Just Cause or Desert Storm. You're gone for a few months and you're back. I mean, you're back and then you're going back again. Yeah. Yeah, and after, um, so after 9-11 happened, uh, I think it was the one year anniversary and my wife was teaching school and she said, we're going to do something for 9-11. Oh, we don't want to bring that up. We don't want them to remember that. And my wife's like, what? <laughs> you don't want to remember that? And she goes, my kids, they're not praying for the military. They're praying for individual people that they know. Right. So it's not, you know what I mean? It's very, That's very the personal. Biggest, yeah. The biggest failure to not remember. I mean, I can't oh, yeah, even and, believe and they, they would. And they let her do it. They let her, they, they had a nice ceremony at the school, but um, I guess the point is it's when you're that wife, that kid, I just can't imagine. I mean, for us, it's easy. All we got to do is go overseas and drink Red Bull and shoot at people. I mean, that's really all. That's, that's the, that's like, you guys had Red Bull? Yeah, when they gave us Red Bull, I remember Victory Chow Hall had Red Bull. I've seen guys like OD three on days Red Bull. and then it was gone and we never yeah. saw it again. And you I've had, seen guys OD on Red Bull. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've seen them break down on Red Bull. <laughs> like, okay, you're off the Red Bull, bro. You're, uh, you're <laughs> Were off. you in the same squad as Spooner? No, no, um, he was in A, I was in C. Oh, okay. Yeah. Tom's a good friend of mine though. I put him through OTC. Oh, awesome. Um, when he was, one of the events we have to do is the upper body round robin. And at the end of it, you got to do this five mile run. Here he comes and he's, this to make a long story short is he doesn't pass the time. Comes across the line and he's kind of smiling and he's just ripped, but he's having a hard time. And, you know, and, and I'd been the shooting instructor for him and I'm like, what's going on here? The other instructors are like, look at him. He's, he's smiling. We need to fire that guy. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. Something's <laughs> got to be wrong with this dude. Look at him. I mean, the guy's a specimen and what's up, you know? So they went and had him x-rayed and he had a broken leg. 
So he ran five miles with a broken leg. He finished he just didn't the UBR do, with a broken he leg. He just didn't do it fast enough. It's like, <laughs> that's the dude we want. I'm thinking that's the And guy. he's still smiling. Yeah, he's still smiling because he's insane. He's you know smiling what I mean? or grimacing. Like, ah. Crazy yeah. so bitch. Yeah, so it's like, that's the dude, that's the that's dude right. that's that, right. that you want. We had another guy. I called him Slim Jim because his name was Jim and he wasn't slim. And... He, Why do uh, I feel attacked? <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, they didn't like him because they always thought he was, why is that guy smiling? And he said, yes, Sergeant. And I was like, well, cause that's what they're supposed to say. And he's smiling cause he's a friendly guy. So anyway, he ended up making, he comes to C squadron and, uh, he gets shot up real bad. There was a friendly fire incident when the, the bird shot and the gun got blown offline. You remember that? Yeah. So a ranger was killed and Jim was hit and he had, I don't know how many wounds he had, but he had at least 20 frag wounds frag in his wounds. body. Wow. So when they get him up to, this guy's a big dude, a big like corn fed dude, you know, I think he's from Ohio or something. And uh, so they get him on the operating table and they, cut him open and they spread his guts out down the table and they start going through and cleaning up stuff and stitching up stuff like they do. And then they put them all back in there. So what I didn't know was that he had popped open like a frog. So when they put everything back in, it swelled up and his belly popped open. So I go up there. Don't worry. This, this story gets better. <laughs> I, uh, I, I go up to, to Walter Reed with my wife to see him. And I walk by and I see this little skinny dude sitting in this wheelchair. And I'm like, well, that ain't Jim. I'm like, what? There's his name on the door. And I look again. This dude's lost like 30 pounds in two weeks or something. I mean, he looks oh, wow. terrible, you know? So he's facing the other direction. So I walk up. I'm like, Slim Jim. And he's like, hey, what's up? You know, and he turns around and he's so excited to see me and Melinda. And he's talking to us. He goes, check this out. And he pulls open his gown. And he has got this cut stem to stern, and he's got rubber tubing over his abs. They've went in there and stitched his abs together with rubber tubing to pull everything together to keep him from splitting open again. And my wife is like, I'll be in the hallway if you need me, you know. <laughs> Feel free to sit right yeah, back down, yeah. son. Yeah. <laughs> well, but I, 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 I will never forget this. The kid's name is Chase. We, it, was a, it was a day one towards the end of my instructor time at the, at the TACP schoolhouse. And it was a different team. So it wasn't my team, but generally on the day ones, we all go over there and start yelling at him and fucking with him. And there's this guy that was pretty heavy. I walk over and I'm like, holy shit, you must be lost. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. he's in the pushup position. And he looks up, he goes, I think I could say the same thing to you there, Sergeant. <laughs> and all the instructors looked at me like, are you going to fuck him up? I go, no, I like that one. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Like, that's the one we want. Yeah, like, that's the He's guy. not miserable. We're yeah. smoking the shit out of him, and he's fucking still making jokes. Yeah, yeah. I like that one. Yep. <laughs> we had a guy, um, this guy's name was Gamblin, and he did these long races. So when he went through the course, I mean, he was setting records with his speed, and he ends up, getting out of the military or at least he left the unit. I don't know if he was out of the military or not, but he goes on one of these, these, uh, Endura races yeah. or something like that. Gambling. You remember him? Tom yeah, Gambling? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I Short guy, yeah, yeah, just yeah. an animal, animal, small dude, but that dude could just go. So they get lost and he's like, you got to slow down. We got to figure out where we're at on this map. So finally, he's like, just, you got to stop so I can figure out where we're at. He's navigating and they're trying to run and they got a girl, you know, cause he had to have a girl on the team yeah, and they got yeah, these yeah. dudes. So they all get over there and he's like trying to figure out on the map where he's at and they start crying. All of them start crying. 
And they look at him. He's like, what are, what's going on? And the one says, this is the lowest point in my life. And Tom goes, huh, this ain't even close to the lowest point in my life. And they're like, what, ha- what has this guy been through if this isn't even close to that lowest point? But I think that, you know, you, you reality. Puts things in perspective. Yeah, put things in perspective that. You really think this sucks? No, this doesn't suck. Here's what sucks. It's an you important know? lesson. Things can always get worse. Yeah. Were you in the <laughs> Were you in C during the Manchester massacre? I was the driver. <laughs> and Corrigan, what you know? Who's my VP now? By the way, do you know that Sean did, Corrigan is the VP that. of the Special yeah. Hostile Warrior Foundation? I was the only guy that didn't get fired in that chain of command. He didn't him. either. No, right? no, he, he didn't. didn't. But every zip, zip and all those did, guys did. Yeah. yeah, but I was the driver. In something called the Manchester Massacre. Yeah, that's a, I don't know if we can talk about that. <laughs> I think you should talk well, about it in general terms because it was So basically, funny. here's what happened. It was pretty funny. We're training- I don't think we can talk about that. So basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a pretty good story. Oh, it's awesome. It's a pretty good story. It's Tom, so, so, trying to make so, stories. <laughs> yeah, so Manchester Road. You know Manchester Road? Oh, yeah. yeah. Manchester. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Bragg. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. 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 Go famous ahead. road yeah. made even more famous by this mission. Um, <laughs> Names have been changed to protect. Yeah, so the I innocent. really wasn't there. I'll just pretend this is another guy. Yeah. We'll call him <laughs> Kyle. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> we're, we're doing yeah. really good at this. Yeah. So, so this, this dude that we don't really know his name, he gets called from one blocking position to another. We are rehearsing to go and do like a Pifwick thing in Bosnia or something. So, we get called over and there's Zip and here comes a car. We're going to stop this car. Zip runs up there and shoots this vehicle with some munitions and they turn around and they take off. He goes, get him, boys. <laughs> and I'm driving an F-350. Remember those big trucks like y'all had? <laughs> Next thing I know, I'm going 85 miles an hour chasing this dude. And I go, hey, that's not our guy. And my team leader goes, you know, you need to ram him. I'm like, I'm like that. That's not our guy. There's a couple things know. that clued me in because they said, "Do not go over 60 miles an hour when you're chasing, crashing somebody." That's one. <laughs> Don't crash anybody that's not wearing a helmet. That's two. So the dude was going 85 miles an hour. He didn't have a helmet on, and he's a black dude. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, this is all not coming together quite right here. So I rammed him. <laughs> he had a he had he had a reliant k car and i put the back of the trunk even with the back windshield i mean i hit him pretty hard you know it didn't do any damage to the truck so now he's driving like he's scared for his life because he is scared for his life this guy thinks he's going to get murdered by a bunch of rednecks you know what i mean seriously it's it's north carolina mm. And you got rednecks with guns. There's no, they're, they're, everybody's in civilian clothes. This dude doesn't know what's going on. So he takes off. And you know where the Bailey Bridge is there? That crosses over. So if you come down McRidge, you hit Manchester. When you take that left on a Manchester, like you're heading to Southern Pines, yeah. that Bailey Bridge there, mm-hmm. you go into Northern Training Area. Yeah. Right before that, he comes to a sliding stop and there's smoke rolling out from his vehicle. And he gets out and he runs into the woods. And I hear Zip on the radio, rabbits in the woods, get him, boys. And I'm like, <laughs> so I'm walking through the woods and I've got a Sims gun in my left hand, squeezing the light on my, my blue up at night at night. <laughs> so I'm, I'm lighting the woods up with a simunitions gun. And I've got my hand on my 1911, a hot gun, a real gun. And I'm like, this isn't our guy. So this other <laughs> dude comes up and he goes, What's up? And I go, dude, this isn't our guy. He's like, whoa, what are we doing out here? You know? So everybody, you know, ex Phil, we go back. Um, the guy's still in the woods. Still in the woods. He spends still. like two days in the woods. Yeah. Finally, Holy shit. Yeah. He finally comes out of the woods and I had written a statement. I went to ram him and he slammed on his brakes, which is, was true. And my Sergeant Major said I was lying. And then that guy comes out of the woods and says, yeah, they, I looked like they were going to ram me or they were coming up behind me and I slammed on my brakes and then they hit me. So then it jived. So I didn't get fired, but this guy's like, they go, his legs look like they'd been hit with a chainsaw. And cause he'd ran through the, he thought he was going to get killed. Yeah. So, uh, he said, well, what, you know, we, we'd like to settle with you here, you know? And he says, well, if you give me $2,500 for my car, we'll be good. 
And they're like, here's 2,500 <laughs> bucks. You're done. Now, wasn't he stepping out on? Uh, oh, I don't know. I don't know that part. But the, see, the vehicle, like the, the the radio was pulled out of the dash. There was some sketchy stuff going on. Yeah. But I mean, it was sketchy. Didn't the sheriff have to come out with a megaphone to get him to come out of the woods? I don't know that part because I was scared to death. I thought I was going to get fired. Yeah, I was. I wasn't worried about that joker. I was worried about <laughs> not having a job. This is going. You went full Robin Sage. Yeah, and then, and then the oh, next yeah. thing I did was I failed a piss test. And then that really got me on the bubble. <laughs> you failed a piss test? I failed a piss test. Yeah. Too many, too many poppy uh, There's a lot of things I'm telling you guys, and I don't know why. I feel like you're my doctor. You're just real comfortable right now, Kyle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been holding this in for years, and I just got to give it out. But. You remember Terry Malgram? No. So Terry still works there, and he uh, he was my troop star major, and he come one day, and he goes, walks in the team room, and he opens the vault door and he looks, nobody's in there. He shuts the door and he goes, sit down. I'm thinking, what's going on? Uh oh. I'm thinking I'm going to get taken to the woodshed by this cat or something. I did something to piss him off. He goes, what are you taking? I go, what do you mean? Tell me everything you're taking right now. I go, what do you mean taken? He goes, you failed a, peer, a piss test. What are you taking? I was like, I failed a piss test. How did I... You know what I mean? I studied hard for all those tests. And uh, he says, well, you failed a piss test. What are you taking? And I said, oh, my goodness, you know, this is crazy. Because if you failed, failed, failed a year analysis, you were done. Oh, you're yeah, fine. yeah, you're gone. You're gone. So I said, I'm, well, I'm taking creatine and I, I've taken some Motrin or whatever, you know. And he goes, all right, don't worry about it then. I'm like, don't worry about it. So then I see my SAR major and he's like, uh, heard you, I heard you failed the year analysis. I'm thinking... I'm done. And uh, yeah, I'll say. Yeah. So one of the medics comes up to me and he says, You find out what you failed that piss test for, and it'll be in your records. And I was like, Roger that. That's awesome. Because <laughs> I don't know, I don't even know what it is. So then I find out it's uh, some barbiturate. And I forget the name of the barbiturate, but I, I saw the name of the barbiturate and I went, I haven't taken anything like that. So I don't know what the deal is. So I go home and that's back when it was like dial up internet. <laughs> you know, do all that. And my wife sees it and she goes, well, let's, we didn't say Google it then. Cause you didn't have Google, but ask Jeeves. Yeah. Whatever you, yeah, whatever yeah, you did. Exactly. So we get online and she puts in what I'd pissed hot for. Bam. It comes up this and caffeine and aspirin equal this medication that she had for her migraines. And I had had come home one day from work and I was just like, probably TBI or something. I don't know, but my brain was bad that day. And she goes, well, here, take one of these. And she gives me this pill. And I'm like, woo, I feel good. You know, <laughs> well, that's what it was. So now I've got the bottle. The bottle's like, it's a tiny little bottle. There's like 10 pills in it. And there's two missing. She took one. I took one. So the next day I come to work, I'm like, dun, 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 dun. you know, here I am. I know what I did. I walk in, I'm like, there it is. That's what it's from. And they're like, you know, it's a felony to take somebody else's prescription. I was just going to say, say, you just rogered like, up to. Oh, man. So now, <laughs> so now I'm a felon. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So, Things are going downhill for you. <laughs> so then we had a commander at the time. And that was probably not super well thought of. But he, uh, he made me take a piss test. I think it was every six weeks. So I took a bunch of piss tests. I, of course, I never failed another piss test, but that taught me a lot there about, you know, don't take oh, somebody yeah, else's yeah, 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 yeah. dope for whatever, you know, it's just, it'll catch up with you. But yeah, there was my <laughs> urinalysis uh, failure. That's I can put that well, in my resume. I would say that's a one-ups when I have a, I can't compete. <laughs> I can't compete on that one. Nope, nope. Never failed one of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this has been a gem. Yeah, we haven't talked about Somalia as much as I thought we would, but that's probably a good thing. It's <laughs> it's a long time ago, but you know, it's it's what's been interesting about this is this last few years, I've done more interviews about that oh, with yeah. people than I've than I've ever done, and most of them have been children. Children, really, kids, really. I'm getting these calls. Their dad knows me. Or their dad's read one of my books or their dad or yeah. mom doing a report, or doing a, a report yeah, for well. school or whatever. And it's been very, very positive. It's not like these kids are coming like, 
yeah, I don't like that you went, you know, they're not like Ilhan yeah, Omar's yeah. kids. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> Bless her heart. You know? <laughs> did you see that when I was on Fox? Fox and I no, said, No, what did you do? They wanted me to talk about Ilhan Omar. And I said, You know, in Tennessee, we'd say, Bless her heart. And Tucker Carlson thought that was funny. Well, within a week, she used that on John McCain's daughter, bless her heart. And I thought she watched it, you know, she must have. Yeah. yeah. So that, I thought that's a, that's a win right there. Yeah, it is. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. You know, do, I think it's, it's awesome that these kids would reach out and yeah, you get to tell the story your or at least my version of the story. Cause I think there's probably 150 versions of that story because yeah. everybody's looking through a different yeah. set of Versus, yeah, different yeah, perspective. Everybody, and and yeah. that's not that people are lying. Yeah, yeah Mike it's, doesn't know anything about the mission. Other because yeah. when he went down fairly early on, so he said, I yeah, I, he didn't have any essay on what happened after the course after that. So, but no, I really like you know getting getting eventually come on and definitely tell it because this is just a form of archive. Yeah, like. You know, I had mm-hmm. I, I I was able to have one of my really good friends that has two silver stars come on and tell both stories. It's like oh, wow. we have that forever now. Like, and you know what? Yeah. In twenty years, the History Channel is going to be doing GWAT stuff. Yeah, and we're going to have all this stuff recorded. It's you know, while started. we're still sharp. And you know, I really think uh, I've been really quiet in this session because I'm just sitting here, kind of in, in awe. I mean, I was in I was in high school in '93. I was I was a junior in high school, and. Uh, I've wow. done some things, but I'm just sitting here listening to you guys talk. I'm, I'm, I'm the little guy in the room here, you know. But- yeah, but I think that the, every every gunfight, whether it's in Portland, you know, going against Antifa or BLM or whatever, yeah. it's th- th- this fight isn't any different than that fight. You know, I mean, th- those dudes are doing things. I don't want to be out there when they're, you know, they're not. They say on the news they're using fireworks against these guys. No, they're not using fireworks. They're using IA, IEDs against police officers in America. I, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I was activated in Seattle. So yeah, there you yeah, go. I so know. you know exactly what I'm <laughs> yeah, talking he's about. Been yeah. Chop. Yeah. 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 I hope, <laughs> I well, I hope you got your licks in while you're in there. Cause that's, no, uh, no licks, but I definitely, uh, ate some gas and saw right, some things. And that's the, that's the, I guess my point is, you know, if you, you go into your little bit of a fight here yeah. in Somalia for a day, well, there's dudes, there's cops that have been fighting these protesters for months. There's 82nd guys that have went in and done, I mean, they're doing stuff with little or nothing. Better yet, how about, you know, you get little Susie Chapstick, you've got some gal from Wisconsin National Guard, and she gets sent to Mosul, Iraq, and she's got to run supplies from the airport to northern Iraq. She doesn't have the training, or he doesn't have the yeah. training, and they're doing that every day. And we're mm-hmm. out there flying at night and we're like, oh, this is dangerous. No. Yeah, it is a little bit dangerous. But what they're doing yeah. is super dangerous. So I, I think agree. it's the whole, and you're right. You know, it's, it's good to hear these stories. I listened to a podcast while I was driving here. And two guys that I put through OTC were on this podcast. I didn't know this. I didn't even, I didn't even know the stories of what had happened to them. And I was in the unit when it all happened. Yeah. Cause you're, you got such a, a, a it's a pile. It's a pile thing. Oh like, yeah. I mean, you're the, so fast paced. It's TDY mm-hmm. train up deployment, come home, take leave for a little bit. Yeah. TDY deployment, train up, leave again. And you're just piling these things yeah. on. And then you realize, Oh shit. What, what, what? <laughs> well, and your yeah, cycles you, are different too. Yeah. So you don't realize what's going on across the hallway. Yeah. It, it was just, I mean, I, it was an emotional episode for these get these cats to do it. And for me, listen, I'm like, I look at them like they're my kids and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. I mean, I, I watched these guys become operators and it was awesome and they're good dudes. And man, it's just crazy. I mean, this, the one poor guy, he gets out of the military and then he ends up, I mean, and, and military stuff was crazy too, but he ends up getting out of the military. He's been divorced finds this lady, falls in love, goes to California, does a startup, checks himself into a hospital. After he does that, his stepson commits suicide. Mm. So he checks himself out of the hospital because he could do that since he checked himself in. 
It's like, man, this dude's been hurting and you don't even know. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Nobody knew because he's not in contact with anybody from the unit. Right. So now he's kind of gotten back with some of in his fold. Yeah, yeah. From his brothers there. And, and I, I don't want to say back with the unit cause he's not. And I think that's a bad thing because the unit's doing their own thing. You, you just need yeah. to stay out of their way. But the guys that were in the unit are having the same struggles. You know, the struggles that we have, you know, you look at what black rifle coffee's done. I mean, this hasn't been easy, you know, coming up with, I mean, it, it's a, it's a big thing what you're doing. That doesn't mean you don't struggle. That doesn't mean you don't have to deal with, you know, the pitfalls yeah. of being a business guy or, or being a retired veteran or whatever. And what I try to tell these guys always is have a mission. Cause I think that's what keeps all of us going. You know, you yeah, know yeah, that it is, yeah. you gotta, you gotta 100%. do something tomorrow. So what I can't just wake up and wander around in my flip-flops with a cup of coffee <laughs> Black rifle coffee. Yeah. <laughs> but you got to, you got to get, you got to stay in that fight and, and have that mission. You like what, yeah, with what focus. you're doing, Clay. I mean, that's awesome. That, you got was, something that gets yeah. you fired up. It is yeah. a good reason to come to work every day to see those kids. And a lot of them, of course, I know, right. That, you know, from guys that we've lost and seeing their kids achieve their success, which is what I would want. If something yeah. happened to me, I'd want someone not to give them a handout but to give them a hand up yeah. and make sure they have yeah. an opportunity to reach their full potential, which is what it's all about. And I think the, the other thing too, you know, we haven't seen each other for a few years and yeah, it's yeah, like that we never, there's nothing, there's no missed beat. Cause that's just how it always was. We, yeah. we would be deployed somewhere and I'd see him once every year or two. And it was, you know, might be the Fayetteville airport or it might be. Blog. I think that was the last time yeah. I saw it. Yeah, just wherever airport. we could run into each other. And I think if if we can stop just doing that ch chance contact, but reach out to other veterans and just yeah. tell them, hey, man, just thinking about you. That's yeah. all you got to really do is tell them you're thinking about you, thinking about them, and then they're going to say... You you don't even have to go that far. Reach out and fucking just tell a story that you both were fucking oh, involved yeah. in. I mean, yeah. that's a that's something I do a lot with my buddies. And yeah, and well, tomorrow's a good day to reach out, though. Right? Yeah, tomorrow the yeah. anniversary, uh, October third. A lot of guys out there. Yeah. Stan Woods floating out there. Oh yeah, I, I always try to reach out to Stan and Dan on on your side there, um, because I of course I served with him continuously until I retired. And, uh, yeah, what, you know, it stands for retirement. He was flying uh, recce missions over in Iraq, you know, at the end there. <clears throat> and they, they played it as retirement, a cockpit recording of him. They're flying along. The and snake? It, the snake. The sn I was there. The yeah. I was in country when that happened. <laughs> Uh, it was like a cobra. It was like a viper. A viper. Yeah, a it was viper. like a pit viper. Yeah, they're yeah. flying, and this thing comes out of the dash. They they take out the avionics kit every day yeah, yeah, when yeah. they were done flying, and they leave it on the hangar floor, doing maintenance on it or whatever. And when they this viper crawled in this kit and they put it in and then the Viper went up through the dash and they're flying this, they're in the middle of this mission and this like highly lethal oh, Viper yeah, comes yeah. out of the, uh, it, while they're flying out of the, out of the dash of the airplane. I mean, the video were in typical stand, you know, well, what's that, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and got a little more excited yeah, yeah. as they went through that. I may, I'm not sure if I got this right, but it might've been renderer that was uh, with him. I'm not yeah, sure. I don't remember for, I know those three guys were over on that rotation because I was the CSM for the task force on that rotation. So I was right there. I'd see those guys almost every day. Yeah. I'd go down from where I was working and see them just to get a breath of fresh air, you know? And yeah, good dudes. Oh man, they were, yeah, that was a funny one. We had another one where Dan was flying for us. He was our eye in the sky that night. And this guy walks out to take a leak. And we all froze. And this guy stops. He had no idea. As he stood there taking a leak, 10 yards from his door, there's 15 lasers on his chest. And Dan was talking to me. You know, he's telling me, hey, you got a guy moving out of this side of the building or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I can't talk because we're so close to this dude that if we talk, he's going he's gonna to hear us. All these lasers are dancing on his chest. <laughs> and he just kind of hmm, hmm, does his thing and then turns around and walks back in. And then we... Continue on yeah, with your evening. <laughs> roll him up. But, uh, but uh, I Could have been worse, bro. Night, Could have been worse. Remember Jesse Betcher? Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. So Jesse, 
both of us said the same thing. As soon as that guy walked in, we both turned and looked behind us to see if we were, if we were backlit or anything. And it was, there was a little hill behind us. So he never saw anything, but we thought if he saw us and he's that calm, we got trouble. He never saw us. He ends up this guy that (laughs) night. He he told me in the, the, uh, the, the interview, he said that uh, he was a Olympic basketball player for Iraq. He was like five two, <laughs> you know. In the interview, like, in the interview, in the interview, yeah. 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 It's kind of like a CNN interview, you know, very, very similar. Yeah. Oh man. Well, this has been freaking awesome. Thank you. Thank you for coming. You've been hiding Thank out, you. man. I've been trying to get with you for. You need to come on my podcast. Uh, absolutely. I think I just drove past your house like two weeks ago. Oh, I must have missed that call. Well, I, I, I was on I was, I was on tight schedule. Oh, I yeah, promised yeah, my yeah. mom I'd see her. She was in oh, Memphis. Oh, bring your mom into it. I was, that's one weekend I wasn't with her. So, you know, you probably. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Now it's now That it's was like Play's weekend. <laughs> Don't I'm, drag me down to your rat hole. Oh, my there. goodness. My sister lives out in Memphis now, so I, I, I'd be out in Tennessee more often. Yeah, man, you got to swing by. And, I want to come and, see uh, the place. Yeah, that'd be awesome. We uh, we've been talking with Evan and Matt and Logan about doing some some forging. I've been forging some knives and tomahawks yeah. and stuff, and just having a blast with that. But uh, oh, no kidding! I didn't realize you're doing. I that. just are got, you selling anything or not? Well, not really. They're not for sale. However, if you make a sizable donation to the Stay in the Fight Foundation. One of them oh, might be that's yours. That's funny. I'm pretty sure that just happened. <laughs> <laughs> no, guys. So I, I'm not going to take orders because I, I'm doing this for my brain, you know, to, right, to, yeah, yeah, to yeah. let me relax a little bit. And if I have to take orders, then it's, no, I already it's, got a no, business. No, it's work now. Yeah, 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 I don't yeah. want work. No, no, I, I want to do this. Yeah, yeah. but I'm doing a bunch you know, of stuff. You know, Meyer's doing those yeah, yeah. rustic knives. And he's, he's doing, doing some great stuff. He's doing some really cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. Twin Tower Steel yeah. Yeah. and... Oh. Disco barrels and things like that. Uh, Craig Morgan, you know Craig, yeah, country singer. He come called me the other day. He wanted me to be on his podcast or this show thing, and I go over there and I do it. And I'm showing him some of these tomahawks because he lives 20 minutes from me. And he picks up this one. I did a, a wire inlay on it as well. So I took this brass wire and I inlaid this arrow mm-hmm. into the handle, and then the handle is curly maple, and it's really a fine little tomahawk that it's a forged one. It's not just a stock removal. And, uh, he goes, Oh, how much for this one? I go, it's not for sale. And he's like, and just bothered him. He's like, well, not for sale. And I go, (laughs) not for sale. Can I order one? No. (laughs) And it pissed him off. So like the whole time we're doing this interview hour of it, you know, he's kind of like, so we get done. He goes, seriously, how much for that tomahawk? And I go, dude, it ain't for sale. But if you make a donation, <laughs> he's like, Roger that. So he made a donation to our nonprofit. And I'm like, there you go. It's yours. He's like, well, that was a lot simpler than that, I thought. You know? Well, now that we've pimped that out, Kyle, what is that foundation? What's the, what's the name so, of it? So stay in the fight foundation. My wife and I started because my wife went in for back surgery and they refused our insurance. She's literally got the gown on and the funny hat and they're about to dope her up and they tell her she can't stand up. Her back is, it was, it went South on like a Saturday night. And then, um, Sunday I took her to the emergency room a week later on Monday, we're in the, in there to get surgery. And so she was on, um, some pretty potent pain medication Mm -hmm. for one week. So she, I go down and I get the checkbook and I come up and I write a check for the surgery. When I, if I would have been in the military, I couldn't have done that. Right. Right? There's no way. Now, it wasn't a lot of money, but it was a huge amount of money when you don't have money. Yeah, yeah. So I wrote the check, gave it to him. She goes in one hour after her surgery. She was walking and pain-free. So that's a blessing. You know, that's awesome. Yeah. And it took her about two months to, to clear the fog from having taken that medication. So now let's think about a private in the 82nd and they keep telling him to take these pills. He doesn't have an out. He can't write a check right. to fix it. He's got to do what he's told and take this, you know, whatever it is, oxycodone or right. whatever. So you get these kids that are getting addicted to it. And by kids, I mean anybody younger than 50 years old, you know, anybody <laughs> younger than me. I'm not offended. Thank is you. He's a kid. I am. 
but you don't want that to happen to him. So she goes, well, we're going to start a, I I've decided we're going to start a foundation. I'm like, a foundation. No, I don't want anything to do with it because I've seen all the craziness. You know, they take a vet that's jacked up and they walk him across the stage. Everybody feels sorry for him and they give all this money. And then that kid goes back to his crappy life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. Nothing happens to take care of that dude. So I said, I'm not, I'm not doing it. And Melinda goes, well, first of all, it's not going to be for veterans. It's going to be for any human being. And I'm like, okay, keep talking. She goes, and every bit of the money that we take in goes to the people. It doesn't, there's no admin cost or none of that. And I understand that some organizations have to have that. That's fine. But this one doesn't, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it could be, uh, oh, and the other thing is you got to have a job. This isn't meant to be welfare. You know, this isn't meant to be for the veteran that's been the gap. to every freaking organization and freeloaded from all of them. Because you see guys that do that. Oh, yeah. If a guy needs help, go get help. But once you've gotten your help, then go help another person. When you're a yeah, professional yeah, yeah. veteran. Yeah. yeah so I've, so yeah. all that just pisses me off. So that. this one, we've said, you know, we're going to take donations when we can. And and she, she did tell me this yesterday when I was driving here. She said, when... When you went on the free range podcast, mm-hmm. that has been our single biggest donation day ever. Right. No, that's awesome. <laughs> you know, because we're talking to the, we're talking one to the customers that are going to need this, you know, it might be yes. the homeless or the, not the homeless, the, 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 the single mom that, you know, maybe she's not watching this podcast, but maybe her brother is, you right, know, she's right, having a hard right, time right. paying her bills. Well, we can help. One time we pay the bill. We don't pay the person. We had a guy the other day. He's like, I know this is going to sound stupid, but I got to go in and get like eight teeth pulled. And I don't have the money. First of all, I feel bad for dude that's got to get eight eight teeth pulled. Yeah. So we get a thing from the doc and it's for the extraction of these teeth and we pay for it. Because that's, that's a roadblock in his life. Like if he can't do that, he's in pain and doesn't have the money to pay for it. We had another guy that was a uh, SF guy, 10th group friend of mine. We're just driving down to the range road. And he's like, I said, how's the TBI treatment going? He goes, yeah, pretty good, but I can't get, I, I'm, I'm not able to get this one um, supplement because the army won't pay for it. And I turned the paperwork into this other 501c3, but it's been like two months and they haven't got back to me. I was like, hmm. So our approval process is, hey, Melinda, what do you think? Yes. So he sends the bill. She pays the bill. He gets his stuff. He gets his brain fixed. So it's not this. We're not trying to build somebody a house or give them a car. We're trying to get them through a month and then go find, you know, find more help there. So it's been, you know, it's been kind of fun. And then the other day she said, well, we're out of money you need to call up some of your rich friends. And I'm like, well, first of all, I don't have any rich friends <laughs> other than Evan. Um, and, uh, no, but I, she, I said, Melinda, if we're out of money, do you know what that means? We're right. doing the right thing. If we, if we spent the money that we have, because if you make a donation, Clay, you, what do you want it to do? Sit in my bank account or go to help somebody. Go to help somebody. So that's what, that's yeah, what's yeah, happening. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, no, I appreciate you. you. Yeah. I mean, that's what it is. It's, it's, there's a, there's a bunch of great organizations out there. We've worked with a bunch of great organizations. We've also worked with some duds and it's made me very cynical. Yeah. I know you oh, guys. Fuck. Yeah. I'm you the know, charitable I, I, giving manager for. Yeah. For yeah. The company, so, so, so yeah, I see yeah. it. And I, <laughs> we've been taken, we've been taken a lot. You know, it's, it's sad because when Just I have guys call me now and they go, Hey man, I see your buddies with the guys at Black Rifle Coffee. Can you hook me? No, I can't. I'm not going to send you to my friends and because I know you're going to, you got to, I don't know, you got something to sell and they ain't buying. So don't, you know, just, no, I'm not going to do that. I've had it too. Like uh, I explained it to one of my buddies that got salty with me. Like, oh, you know, you know, Jack Osborne, can you get me a meeting with him? I want to pitch him a movie. I'm like, no. He's like, why? I'm like, because that's a one-time favor thing. I'm going to use that for myself, yeah, yeah, not yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> if, yeah. I'm, if I'm going to ask yeah. my friend for something like that, I'm asking. I'm yeah. not doing it for somebody else. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Plus, well, I'm not comfortable trust, doing that. Yeah. I'm not comfortable yeah. asking. I'm happy to ask for somebody else in a good way, like... Matt, for instance, right. up and, uh, you know, he's a guy lost his leg on a mission as a cop, just looking to get out of law enforcement for obvious reasons. So I'm happy to help somebody like that. 
Uh, but for something along those lines, I wouldn't, I'm not no, up for oh, that. No, no. It's, it's funny. It's a funny, it is, funny but thing. it's, we just have, we, we just have to be good agents for the people that are making donations. Cause we had a guy from South Dakota. Who's my, um, married to my niece. This guy isn't a dude that's got a ton of money. Yeah. He gave us a thousand dollars. You know how much that's huge. You know, that helped a lot of, you know, that helped like three or four people with the little bit that they needed. But that guy, I mean, we want to be good stewards of their money. And just like, you know, with what you guys are doing. Same thing. It's um, one of our core values, stewardship. It's absolutely correct. You owe it to them, right? You owe it to the people that are putting their faith in you. And that's a huge breach of trust if you're not, uh, you know, if you're not being good stewards of the resources you're providing. Well, for... uh in my position, part of my job is is vetting and picking charities that that we're going to support. And I think uh, we'd be remiss not to to add both the the Special Operations Warrior Foundation and Stay in the Fight, Stay in the Fight, Stay in the Fight, in the fight Foundation to our to our roundup at checkout. So yeah. I think love that. Yep. So yeah. for the for the month of November approved. <laughs> month of November, we're, we're going to see both those charities on the, on the roundup at checkout. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, that's awesome. And that's, I mean, every little, you know, every little bit helps, helps there with what you can do. And we, we did some work with Charlie Daniels journey home foundation and they did two things that I thought were interesting. They took a guy that's homeless and they gave him a bicycle and because of that bicycle. Now he's got his own house. So he'd get to work. He'd or? get to work. Amazing. <clears throat> he'd yeah. get some tools. He could do his fix-up stuff. They got him a house that he could fix up. He, I mean, see, that that to me, that's a success story. They didn't give the guy yeah, a Corvette. So, they yeah. gave him a bicycle. Right. Yeah, they right, had another right. guy that worked with Fifth Group that was an interpreter, and they got him into college. That's cool. You know, that's something that yeah, they didn't have to spend a lot of money because all they had to do was help him do the paperwork to get enrolled in college. So it's I mean, still a game changer. Yeah. And, and things like that are, are huge. And it's not a big money thing. It's going out and actually doing the work to, you know, to help those yeah. folks out. So there's, it's, I don't want to be negative because there are people doing really, really good there stuff. Are. I had a uh, chow last night with a friend of mine, uh, Travis Cox. He's a, a former Marine and he, um, is that the correct terminology? Former Marine? Yeah, it is. It, it does okay, I just want to make sure. Yeah. It's, yeah, ex Marines. No Crayola Crayon, uh, sponsored by Crayola. He, yeah. uh, <laughs> if, he, they, uh, if they could read, I'm sure they'd be upset. I'm, I'm looking yeah. up the, the, the Marine, the Marine Ouch. director up there. Ouch. It doesn't matter. Ouch. Ouch. Uh, so, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, so he, he works with Veteran Outdoors. They do that. He goes, Yeah, but I, I took 29 guys hunting last year, and I was like, well, that's got to add up, you know, taking 29 dudes out to this place to hunt. And then he says, but I didn't ask VO for any of the money. I just did it out of my pocket. Whew. He's a veteran and he's doing that. Yeah. You know what I mean? He's not trying to, he's not advertising that. There's right. no like yeah. website with his picture on it. He's it's probably, just yeah. him taking dudes. And like this year he's taken a guy, these guys don't know it, but one of his drill instructors he ran into and one of the other guys in his platoon, when they went to, to, what do you call it in boot camp? Boot camp. Boot camp. Right? Boot camp. Um, what'd you guys call it? Um, basic training. They, they, basic military. No, you call it something it's like. like uh, summer, summer camps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. summer camps. Like yeah, it's <laughs> like sniffle camp or <laughs> yeah, something yeah. like that. It's just, so he's, these guys don't know it, but he's putting them in the same. They don't know that they're going to link up and, and they were in that situation together. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. that's, that's, that's really a cool, cool thing, but yeah, I agree. I'm like, man, this dude is paying out of his own pocket. So there's a lot of guys that are just doing stuff to help and yeah. whatever. But anyway, I rambled along. Oh, well, no, cool. I'm sorry. Thank you guys both for, for coming on and making this really fun. And then talking about these awesome foundations that you're running and we would be happy to help out. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. God bless America. Yeah.